So hello everybody. It's nice to be here uh, to uh, uh, discuss a bit these uh, the results of this project reducing the precarity of academic research careers. I will talk about some of the findings and insights and then Neda will follow up with recommendations. So I'm back in, in academia, uh, as Brian said, uh, but previously I was the project manager of this project at the OECD Global Science Forum. So um, this is just a collage of the different articles that I find in uh, mainstream media in different countries. So we have The Guardian from the UK, Le Monde in France, uh, the New York Times, uh, Dutch universities. This one is from Denmark. And this shows that precarity of research careers is really a policy concern in many countries. Uh, and so this was uh, one of the motivations uh, to undertake this project. Um, I will start by showing some data. So here we see that the share of doctorate level attainment in the population uh, for 25 to 64 year olds. Uh, and it shows the increase in the last uh, uh, four, five years for which we have data available, OECD data. And you can see the diamonds is 2014 and the dark bars, dark blue bars are 2019. And we can see really that uh, uh, doctor level attainment has been growing and it has grown by a staggering 25% just in the last uh, five year period. And this means that the traditional academic career of course cannot absorb the increasing number of doctor holders wishing to stay in academia. And we can see also that uh, uh, associated uh, with, with this development, uh, we see that the job security is a big issue. So many young doctoral holders will no longer find a stable career position in, in academia. And although around a third of OECD labor force are in temporary or part-time jobs or are self-employed, the scale of precarity is really much higher in the academic research sector especially among early career researchers. And, and the data that we have here, uh, you know, we don't really have good international comparable data, uh, but this one is from, uh, from the International Survey of Scientific Authors, and it only covers corresponding authors. So it already shows a level of seniority of the, the researchers that are represented in this graph. And for instance, in countries, like Germany and uh, Switzerland, even among corresponding authors, uh, more than half are on fixed term contracts. Of course, if we look at the totality of early career researchers, uh, this is even worse. So uh, in many countries, uh, two thirds, 80% even of uh, uh, academic researchers are on fixed term contracts. So this is just to set the scene. And so what, what we started was by looking, uh, even before we did any, uh, any collection of data among the participating countries, we had a look of, of the context uh, in, the, you know, in the academic and policy literature. And what you can see is the increasing weight of competitive funding and third party funding in research and associated with that is an increasing number of doctoral degrees awarded and an increasing number of postdoctoral researchers on fixed term contracts. Uh, and, and the increased share of fixed term contracts relative to those on indefinite contracts. So it's not just a volume thing, you know, there's more money for research, there's more research activity. And because of that, there's more people on fixed term contracts It's also the, the, the relative share of those on fixed term contracts is, uh, is, is increasing relative to those on tenure or civil servant status or open-ended contracts. And there's also a global market for researchers. For instance, in countries like the Netherlands, over half of researchers are uh, 
uh, and our international research. So this exacerbates the competition, makes it a really, really competitive labor market. Uh, the, the other interesting things is, despite these difficulties, uh, there's a, sort of a sense of shame and loss of identity and even stigma towards postdoctoral researchers leaving academic employment, which is quite paradoxical because, in fact, across the OECD, uh, the, the majority and the large majority of researchers work beyond academia. But, but you know, once in academia, as a doctoral researcher and a postdoctoral researcher, the aspiration often is to remain uh, for those early career researchers, but often also for their PIs. Uh, so they, they, this makes it really difficult in terms of the transition to, to other type of employment. The other difficulty uh, is the informal and discretionary recruitment of postdoctoral researchers, which you know, raises questions of equity and the diversity of the academic workforce. So whereas for permanent contracts, there's often very formalized recruitment, that is not the case for fixed term contracts, which uh, are the majority in, in many systems. The other interesting thing is the, the longevity of research workforce means that there's less people living in, in, in many systems, which uh, combined with more people getting into the research workforce also creates uh, uh, problems of transition from a fixed term contract to a more permanent one. And then really complex shared governance arrangements with the uh, uh, central government, local government, highly autonomous universities and research institutions, highly autonomous PIs often with their own research money, supranational uh, arrangements like uh, in the European Union make very complex uh, governance arrangements in the sector. So we, we also uh, took notice of uh, the effects of precarity, and I would like to highlight two important surveys, the Wellcome Trust Survey in 2020 and the First Nature Postdoctoral Research Survey also in 2020. And this gives us uh, some idea of the effects of precarity in terms of the well-being of researchers, um, feeling of insecurity, unkind and aggressive conditions, bullying, mental health issues and so on. And this is creating issues in terms of the attractiveness of research careers. Uh, there's, uh, people feel there's a pressure to publish too much too early. People often feel demotivated with the conditions and also with a few positions and the satisfaction with selection procedures. Um, there's also uh, questions being raised about the quality of science. Uh, these emphasis on quantity over quality, uh, and the, also the associated risk aversion hindering novelty because people want to keep their contracts, they play it safe. And, and so this raises also the issue of, uh, of the novelty in science and of course threats to research integrity. Uh, and finally, uh, some effects regarding equity, diversity and inclusion. Of course, only those that are privileged can afford long periods of precarity which raises uh, questions about the diversity of the research workforce. Women are more affected by precarity, and we know that this has been exacerbated by COVID. There's lots of evidence on this. And of course, problems of transparency in access and promotion, given those informal arrangements regarding those on fixed term contracts. So then after setting the scene, looking at the context, looking at the effects, we actually uh, worked with 15 countries and these countries produce country notes to describe their situation. And then uh, we've interviewed around 100 people and these were divided in panels of policy officials and funders of researchers, employers of researchers and representatives of researchers themselves in 11 countries also at the EU level and with the TUEC members. TUEC is the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. So we, I think we covered a lot of ground and we, we arrived at a list of common challenges. 
One is the permadoc phenomenon. So the postdoc used to be a, a transient period between doctoral research and entering the professoriate. Uh, now you see people going from one contract to the next, almost building a career as a postdoctoral uh, researcher. How dated career structures? So the career structures are still very much based on the professoriate, so assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, or something similar. Whereas in fact, this is not what you see uh, happening with the majority of uh, researchers, but the, the, the careers have not been adapted. Uh, then uh, uh, we've seen also unstructured doctoral phase. What is interesting is that doctoral studies have become more and more structured. Uh, there are schools for doctoral studies, they are offered training, they are often, of, uh, uh, often are offered also career uh, advising and so on, but uh, we didn't see this so much. The postdoctoral phase, in fact, is very heterogeneous within countries, between countries, and so this is another issue. The excessive dependency on senior researchers. So what you see is the PIs, uh, they procure the money, and then there's a, a, a large body of postdoctoral researchers dependent on the senior researchers to get funding, to continue their contracts. And this, you know, some have called it this feudal system raises big questions not just in terms of the well-being of researchers, but also the quality of science, especially in terms of risk aversion and uh, uh, novelty being hindered. Then the lack of diversity in the research workforce, so we knew that from, from the literature, this, this was quite clear from the policy interviews. And we often talk about uh, differences between men and women, for instance, but one of the things that came across uh, very well, but for which there's uh, very little data, is this sense about social class. You know, that uh, the, the, the research career is really for the higher social classes, because the, if you're from a, a more disadvantaged background, you cannot really afford precarity. You don't have uh, the family structures, and the, the, the background to support that. So this, this is an, an, an issue. A lack of intersectoral mobility. Uh, so more and more uh, doctoral researchers uh, are being produced, more and more go into postdoctoral work, but it is difficult to then move beyond academia, although there's no place for everybody in academia, and I would say here, I talk about intersectoral mobility, but in some countries, even intersectoral mobility is difficult. So issues of inbreeding uh, are very prominent as well, especially due to this dependency on senior researchers and the informality of recruitment for fixed term positions. A lot of questions also about compatibility of family life and academic career. Uh, there's some interesting data from Germany that shows that uh, people are not having the children they want when they want relative to other professionals in the labor market because of the pressures of the of, uh, uh, researchers on fixed term contracts that keep postponing family formation. Issues are also arising from international mobility. So there's a discourse promoting international mobility. There are serious challenges for uh, international researchers in terms of pension rights, moving around, uh, precarity in a context that is not their context where they don't have, again, the social support. So th th there's many issues associated uh, and tensions associated with international mobility. Uh, another thing that uh, many people mention is the underdeveloped uh, nature of human resource management in institutions. And, and uh, someone has mentioned that uh, uh, the university develops knowledge in human resources, but then often does not use their knowledge, that knowledge to manage itself. So questions about proper recruitment, transparent recruitment, support in career progression, uh, staff development is often underdeveloped in institutions. 
which means that the academic career is really no longer attractive for some. So the fact that there's so many postdocs and they're competing, but some countries are questioning, especially in some areas that are more market-facing, that in fact, the academic career is no longer attractive to the best talent in some areas and in some countries. Now, this is all qualitative data uh, from interviews, uh, but we really need, and the people have said that, a better evidence based systematic data collection on postdoctoral researchers. Often countries only know about those in the career proper, those in the professoriate. They have statistics about that. But often that is now in the minority. Some countries don't even know how many postdoctoral researchers they have. Some universities don't even know because the people that recruit them is the PIs directly. And so um, there's this score for better evidence space. And then of course, uh, this is a work in progress. Nobody really knows the long-term effects of COVID-19, but uh, there's already some data that shows detrimental effects of COVID-19 especially for younger researchers and especially for women. So uh, another interesting thing that came out of the interviews is what enables uh, and what are the barriers to change? Uh, one of the enable is consultation with stakeholders. This comes about, you know, I, I told in the context that governance arrangements are complex. So it's important to to, to have mechanisms to bring the different parties together to enact change. And in relation to these uh, sector-wide agreements, so the idea that if you want to have change, you have to bring different stakeholders to the table and reach uh, some sector-wide agreements. Another important thing is funding with strings attached to policy objectives. So as I said, many of the research funding is competitive. It comes from third party funding rather than from poor uh, public funding. And, and uh, traditionally, uh, this relates to excellence in research. What people are saying is when funding comes with strings attached about well-being of researchers, about continuity of employment, about professional development, then it's, it's more likely that policy objectives will be enacted. Another interesting thing is, is the, uh, the, the positive effect of postdoc networks. So there's this idea that doctoral researchers are better organized as a body of people. That is not so much the case. In, but there's some experience with these postdoc networks and this seems to have a positive effects in terms of the improvement of the situation. In terms of barriers, research culture, a research culture focused on metrics, research excellence, exacerbated competition, sink or swim uh, uh, kind of attitude. Incentives, and this relates to, to the second one, incentives shaped by research assessment metrics, uh, leaving out other important aspects uh, to assure uh, well-being of researchers and good quality science. Uncertainty regarding funding, the fact that it's competitive, it's hard for employers of researchers, you know, universities, research organizations to plan ahead and to, to be more stable employment. And something that I've mentioned before, a lack of good evidence base. And this is also a barrier to change. The fact that really accurately, often nobody knows what's happening because of lack of data. So if you want to read more about this, uh, you can check the full report. There's also a chapter on the last uh, science, technology and innovation outlook on the challenges and new demands on the academic research workforce that covers very much the issues of precarity, but uh, beyond that, digitalization, transdisciplinarity. And of course, uh, we can continue the discussion later on or if, if uh, you'd like, uh, you're very welcome to reach out. Um, that's my email. And now I will pass it to Neda to talk about the recommendations.